other thing is just start early because this is a project based on Java. If you don't have enough experience with Java, you will hit some stumbling blocks. You can email me for uh, clarifications regarding the project, but I won't have enough bandwidth to help you with your Java problems. I can help you with the project problems. Okay. Start early so that you have enough time for analysis. As you will see, there are only 10 points for the code and the results, but there's 20 points for the analysis. So give yourself enough time for the analysis. That's it, and if you have any problems, email me. And you would not tell you in email. I will give you a CAC 494 help email address. If you send it there, it will go to him as well as one other person who is helping him. And one of them will answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, if you want to save the next 15 minutes of your life, you can leave. The rest of you are have no life. <laughs> You, you actually need to know, to compute the term frequency correctly, you need to have the max of the term frequencies of all the terms in that document. So you need one more entry for each document, which is the maximum term frequency. Do you see what I'm saying? That's one more thing you can amortize. Okay. While you are keeping the document, you know, for each document you should know what its maximum term frequency is for any of the terms. And that you need to use because that's how you know. So this is basically trying to deal with some of the imprecision in the user's queries. Again, it's one of these things where you know that the users probably don't know what they're looking for, and they don't know how to convert what they're looking for into keywords, and we are all sunk. However, if they misspell a word, maybe we'll tell them that they misspelled the word. That's basically what tolerant dictionaries is. Okay? A tolerant dictionary essentially, in, for this case, uh, is essentially to say if I if the user were to type a word that's not present in the lexicon, it's not present in the dictionary, then you can say no answers, or you can give something close to their, I mean, answer close a word that's close to that word and say is this the word you meant, which is pretty much what all of you see when spelling correction gets done. Okay, did you mean to ask this? And in cases where both your word as well as the word that you probably wanted to type are both present, search engines like Google, for example, say, we are giving you the better words answers, but if you still want to mistype your you know, word, then you can still click on this and I'll give you the answers for that. Because interestingly enough, they have all words, including the misspellings. You know, if you can, if you can index the, what stops you from indexing all misspellings of all words? You see what I'm saying? And so they have, you know, maybe you're interested in figuring out. In fact, as I said, sometimes, for example, you can tell which of the spellings are more common. I mean, there's this old thing about any time I misspell and somebody asks me, how come you don't know spelling? I say, oh, I just, I'm from India, I use English spelling. And they could not tell the difference because nobody knows what English do in this spelling, right? And now, of course, you can actually check with respect to Google, you know, what's the majority spelling for this? Right, and so you get the number of hits, and that's the way you can tell. Anyway, um, so the, the, the simplest problem here is I give you a word which is misspelled, it's probably not present in the document, in the lexicon. I want to see the closest words to that word and suggest them to the user and say, Would you like to take it? Okay, now this is finding words close to my word. Until now, we are looking, which becomes a sub problem of finding documents that are close to query document. So pretty much whatever we need for documents we get to do for words now. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning of the lectures that um, uh, that the similarity of the, so, so the, the shingles for shingles for files are grams for strings. And I can do k gram representation 
of, of strings. Each word is a string. I can do k-gram representation of a string, and then I can, for example, compute the similarity between the user's query, user query word, and all the lexicon words, and see which are the top five lexicon words that are closest to this, and then show them to the user. So to be able to do this, the most important thing you need to do, so that's what we are doing here, okay? And to do that, essentially, uh, you need to find a distance measure. You need to find a distance measure from two words, between two words. Okay, and one idea that I sort of gave to you just now is distance measure in terms of k-grams. Okay, we'll talk about it. In fact, if you do it in k-grams, which is the one that I hopefully get to in today's class, you can use Jacquard similarity metric. So the, each word in the dictionary has its set of k-grams, so let's say three grams, okay? And then the query word is also converted into k-gram representation. So now each word becomes a set, and you have two sets, and you take the Jacquard similarity. That will tell you what is the, what's the similarity between those words. Okay, uh, there are of course other ways of, so that's a k-gram method. There are also other ways of checking for errors. One of which is, this captures some of the errors, Okay, but even among the, suppose it turns out that there are multiple words which are the same k-gram distance away from the query word, and I want to see which of them could have been the word that the user was trying to type. Remember what I just said, type. Not all errors are created equal. Certain errors are much more likely than other errors when you're typing. Do you understand that? First of all, how many of you know why why is it the case that this thing has A, S, B, F, G, blah, blah, blah? Okay, just show me how many people know. Okay, the rest of you should be sort of, you, you have no clue as to, you're just using technology without knowing why. Why don't they have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H? Why A, S, B, F, etc.? Um, okay, think, let's think about this. Is it because it's the most efficient way to lay out the words? To lay out the letters? No. Say, so tell me, what is the reason? Um, with old typewriters, if you have uh, frequently typed letters close together on the little hammers that are nearby each other, they'll hit each other when you type fast. Exactly. So this keyboard layout spaces them out the absolute most if you're trying to move the file. This, so I'm saying exactly the opposite of what could be a reasonable reason for this, which is this is meant to slow you down. This is meant to slow you down. You know, in the in the old typewriters, if you type words next, letters next to each other very fast then both the hammers come, try to hit in this small you know, space where they go and make an impression. If two of them go hit there, then you have to stop typing very, you know, I have actually done typing in my life. I have taken a typing exam. I'll show you next class my typing certificate. Okay. <laughs> so that you believe me. And so there would be, you know, it's this amazing thing. The typing exams, are, you know, these are all these mechanical typewriters. Everybody's typing away, a huge amount of noise. And then every once in a while it's punctuated by tack, somebody's stuck and then they have to bring it down. And those guys have lost the exam because by the time they brought these things back, they're in trouble. Now this used to happen to everybody all the time before. And so this is basically the QWERTY typewriter. The QWERTY typewriter's layout was conceived so that the letters that always come right next to each other in English language are kept as far away from each other on the typewriter as possible. Right? So for example, Look at it, I actually don't even know where the letters are. You know, for us, all of us who are touch typewriters, the only way I can figure out where the letter is, is to feel with my, you know, for my fingers, right? So, what is the letter that comes right after Q in most English words? U. So there is Q, there is U. You need to use your different hand to hit U, which will build in, build in latency. If you have QU, you will just use little finger and the next little finger to type right both the same way and both of them will go get stuck. Now, this doesn't make any more sense actually now because now, you know, we are in the, in the you know, electronic stuff and so they can make uh, nanosecond distinctions can be captured. So, in fact, many people, some of you, maybe one of you guys use non-QWERTY typewriters. So, he really types fast, okay? Because QWERTY, maybe not. <laughs> so, so Dorak, for example, is a typewriter layout that's supposed to allow faster typing. QWERTY is actually is meant to slow you down. However, 
Irrespective of the layout you have, there are certain kinds of errors you make more often than others. How many times have you seen this very useful word called HTE? My mails are full of HTE. Because the THE, and then there's a fractional distinction, and then the H comes first and the T comes next. So not all errors are created equal. HTE is created more, equal, more times than THE. So you could actually, among the words that are the same k-gram, you can say, hey, you can see which errors are more likely. You can have a model of the errors. Okay? And you start to figure out what is, which of them are, is the real word that you probably have met. And then, of course, now, as if this is not enough, uh, you can also do phonetic corrections. Okay? Certain people will basically, most of us, in, you know, not from English, uh, would basically try to assume that English is phonetic, which it is anything but. Okay, uh, I think uh, I'll come up with this. And Bernard Shaw once said that something like fish can be pronounced as jail or something like that. You know, you just use what? G-H-O-T-I. G-H-O-T-I can be pronounced as? Fish. Fish, yes. So, G-H-O-T-I can be pronounced as fish. In English, because G-H, in R-O-U-G-H, is fa, sound. <laughs> right, right. Okay, and ti in tion is sha sound, and so nothing really stops me from saying kati is really fish. And those of you who gotten into English for long enough time and lived with its bad rules, think, how can you do this? <laughs> but, but you know, when when you're asking me to say this, that you're not supposed to say l. I'm thinking. Where are you coming from? You know, why write a letter if you don't want to pronounce it? You know, most of the people who ask, my, look at my name, are very surprised, saying, which one am I supposed to pronounce, which am I not supposed to pronounce? <laughs> Here's a clue. If you ever see an Indian name, pronounce everything. <laughs> everything. Okay? It's a real clue. Because English, you know, the Indian languages are phonetic. We write the way we say. Okay? And so, in fact, you can pronounce every letter there. In English, you, see, you know, it's keep come from them. I mean, French don't even get me started. <laughs> right? So the interesting question is, basically people might be actually looking for fish and could have typed ghati. And you should be able to, you know, figure that out. I mean, that's extreme form, but, you know, phonetic-based corrections. Because there are certain errors that people tend to make, you know, especially because, you know, I'm sure there are more non-English speaking people using English search engines than English speaking people using English search engines, and you still need to help them, because they too will click on your advertisements and get your money, <laughs> right? So you need to do that, right? Um, so that's the other type of, uh, you know, error models, computing which errors are more likely, learning which errors are more likely and using that to correct words. That's a quite a useful thing. Uh, so mostly that's what we will do next class. Um, I think I'm just going to show the K-gram one, because you already know this. So for example, uh, you know, I can have, uh, if I have two words and uh, I have a k-gram representation of those words, then I can construct inverted index over the grams. Okay. And then I can use jacquard similar. So finally, basically, if I have the word in the dictionary, the word in the query, I have the k-gram representation, or the two-gram representation of both of them, I compute the jacquard similarity. That's what I want to do. But if I need to do it efficiently, because my lexicon is probably a million words large, I need an index. So see the complete parallelism between dealing with documents versus dealing with words. Okay, you need an index now of grams. And then you use that to compute the jacquard similarity. Okay, This much at least you should understand by today's class. Um, uh, so now, of course, how do we decide to be able to do this, then you are essentially seeing what the user typed and which of the words in the lexicon seem to be close to it. It's not necessary that Google is not actually correcting your spelling. Even Google is just trying to see. We can all talk to each other and say, in fact, that's how language also is. You know, we can all talk to each other and say, now tomorrow onwards, we shall write G-H-O-T-I when we mean fish. And Google will catch on to that. Because essentially there will be a lot more documents with G-H-O-T-I. And so it will now have a, an entry in the index. OK? 
Okay, and about 10, 20 years later, Oxford English Dictionary will also put it in. You see what I'm saying? Um, so the really, there is, it's not spelling correction with respect to a dictionary. It's just figuring out you wanted something. I want to sell you stuff I have. And I'll see which ones are close to what you're looking for and see you know, whether I can sell it to you. Again, the used car salesman. You know, there's this, uh, so basically, you look for lexical entries which have large enough indexes. And those are probably real words. If it only is appearing in one document, while its IDF is amazingly good, it's probably also a complete nonsensical word. There is such a thing as being very high IDF that nobody is ever going to ask that query. Right, a random string of letters, which is you know like ten thousand letters long, will I'm, I'm pretty sure will have IDF of log of the size of the document corpus. But it's useless word because nobody is ever going to try it. So most of the words that you have probably will have some amount of index in that. And so you're trying to look for this word which doesn't have a large enough index and see maybe you want something which has a bigger index. Okay, that's what you wind up with. So lexicon is your ground truth. There is no Oxford English Dictionary. We'll stop here. Next class we'll talk about other distance measures that make sense for English words. Okay, and then move on to correlation analysis.